you, Carrie, and Lisa, <laughs> and Linda in the back, our greeter and our host. Um, yes, I'm Debbie Valentine, and let me get up my presentation here. So a lot of you are here because you want to know how to do a bee garden, right? And most of you, probably all of you, are also concerned about the drought, right? So guess what we get to do both tonight? Isn't that cool? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about creating a bee-friendly garden, and that means we're going to talk about creating a bee habitat. And you're, I have some questions here. You know, why would you care? Why would, you know, I said, they're going to want to know. Why did, why? Most of you probably do care and probably know a lot of the reasons why, but let's go through them real quick. So um, bees um, provide important services to um, both humans and the ecosystem. They pollinate our crops and pollinate the various flowering plants throughout the world. Um, most pollinators are insects. And insects are an important part of our food chain. And that's really key because the food chain, insects are really low on the food chain. And so lots of critters eat insects. And then other critters eat those critters and other critters on and on. So you can imagine if the insects were gone, how many critters we'd be affecting. A lot of this is because of uh, the problems with bees today. And we're not just talking about honeybees, but also uh, native bees and other insects are in trouble. There is a uh, decline in their numbers, and most of it is because of our human impact. And that is due to pesticides and habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and ha habitat degradation. So when we say like um, loss, you know, it's kind of obvious that when we put in a new store or parking lot or whatever that we've lost some habitat. But fragmentation is also a really interesting thing because that's where, you know, you have, um, you know, you, now you have a shopping center where there was habitat and you've broken the habitat. So that's now no longer habitat. So there's habitat here, there's habitat over there, there's nothing here, there's nothing there, there's habitat here. It's fragmented. And so one of my goals in life is to help people understand that we need to kind of bring that quilt back together, you know, kind of stitch it all back up so that we have habitat for insects, bees, birds, butterflies, and all of that. And of course, degradation, you know, there's habitat out there, but it's got nasty weeds. And Steve and another gal here, Janine, I'm sure there's others here who go out and weed the parks, you know. <laughs> Janine was saying, that's silly, I weed the parks. Doesn't that sound silly? But that's, you know, that's part of improving that degraded habitat. So who are the bees? By the way, I don't know if you can see, but that's, there's a little title on each one of these photos. That is a uh, male valley carpenter bee. They're about this big. How many of you have not seen one? Uh, okay, a few people haven't seen one before. They look, they're fuzzy and brown. They're really, really big. And you think that you should be scared, but you don't need to. And we'll talk about that later. But that's one of those big guys there staring at you. Okay, so honeybees. Honeybees are from Europe. They are not native. They are naturalized. They live in, in, in the wild and they live in hives and that sort of thing, but they are not native. And native bees are native to California. They were here for millennia. Now what we're gonna, we're gonna talk, um, uh, you're gonna get to know the bees a little bit tonight, along with the plants. Um, there, uh, we're gonna go through some behaviors and I have um, some fun, some fun behaviors for you. So we'll have a good time. Hmm. Let's see, it's not going anywhere. Let me try again. There we go. So how did I do it? Ah, it went ahead of itself. Let's go back. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, how did I do it? So, um, 
The important thing to understand is if you're putting, how many of you are planning on putting in a new garden, brand new? Okay, a couple people. So most of you already have some, some kind of a native garden already started. Most of you would raise your hands on that. Okay, great. So most of you had to do some planning. You had to figure out what plants you wanted. You had to uh, figure out what their cultural needs were. Did they need shade? Did they need more water, less water? Um, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of planning involved. And um, I ended up taking two years to plan, not because I wanted to. <laughs> um, my, husband, my husband's back there. He's the one with the nose. Hey, Mr. Nose. Yeah, that's hubby. Um, <laughs> you can just say hi, hubby, when you see him later. Um, <laughs> he, he had um, some health issues, and then I had some health issues, and so for about a year, we had ended up postponing um, our planting. But during that time, I continued reading and learning and researching um, both through books and online. <clears throat> then we sheet mulched our lawn, and that is a much bigger lawn than it looks like. That is a very, very big space. Um, <clears throat> And, um, and that's what it looked like when it was finished being sheet mulched. Then we went in and planted, and I want to walk over here because some of these things might not be obvious. There's um, not only little plants in here, but there's, there's you know, uh, boulders, and there's some decorative, uh, decorative branches. Actually, my friend over here picked them out for me. Uh, so, and there's a mound in the center. Later, I put some mounds in a couple other places. So, you know, starting to build the garden, and I had the people come and help me and that sort of thing. I didn't do it all by myself, but, um, so planting. And then this was the first spring. We were pretty amazed, and probably because we had a lot of angels, you know, that helps. Those first few years, just having those bright colors. And it immediately started to become a bee haven. When you start making a, uh, a little ecology in your backyard, there are predators and there are um, critters that aren't predators. And you can see there's a white spider there holding a honeybee and going to eat it. Um, <laughs> our dark star Cianothus every year has these amazing white spider spiders, they're crab spiders, and they actually are predators. They sit on the edge of the leaves with their you know, front legs out, waiting for a pollinator to come nearby and then grab them. They don't build, um, you know, webs or anything. They just snatch them. And they're bright white, and you can see them from the other side of the yard. You cannot imagine how they even survive for a minute, you know, that all the birds would be eating them or that the insects would see them, but obviously they don't. Okay, so five years later, and another area. So, your next question is the obvious question why you're here. How do you go about creating that bee friendly garden? So, let's move to that. So there's five easy steps to doing that, and we're going to talk about the first four in detail right now, and then that fifth one is really about the plants, and so we'll get into the, that in, in uh, much, much greater detail. So the first one is no sides. Some of you who go to Foothill know what I, exactly what I mean, because this Frank, <laughs> one of our instructors would say, no sides. Okay, no pesticides. No herbicides, no fungicides, nothing with side on the end. Because guess what? Side means we're, it's dead, we're killing it, it's poison, it's toxic, okay? And those insects are very sensitive to those poisons. Um, full sun, insects are cold-blooded. They need, they need warm sun. We need a cup of coffee, they need warm sun. <laughs> Nesting areas. Honeybees have hives. Now, we're not going to be talking about how to create a hive for honeybees. That's not what we're going to be talking about tonight. But everything else in the talk will be for honeybees and native bees. Um, but as far as nesting areas for native bees, uh, native bees have um, two types of nests. They don't make wax like honeybees, so they don't have hives. Most of them 
live in the ground. Some of them live in uh, stems and um, uh, wood and that sort of thing, like carpenter bees and mason bees. And we'll get into that a little more. They also need water, just like every creature on the planet. So you can do that by having a little dish under the soil and you put a little water. I know we're, we're saving water, but you know the bees do need water. So you, you can just have some you know, wet soil in a little place. Um, you can have a bird bath. You can have a, uh, a, a fountain. Now, if you do want to have a fountain, one of the things that the um, water district says is that it has to be recirculating water. So if you want to have a water feature, recirculating water is okay. Water running into the ground and going out, no, not okay. <laughs> okay, and then food. And that's what we're gonna spend most of the time tonight talking about is food. Because it's challenging. What do you put in your garden for those bees? <coughs> ah. Okay. We're going to throw in some behaviors. Bees, native bees, most of them don't sting. First of all, all male bees, including male honeybees, don't have stingers. Okay? So that takes half the population out. Then, the females of the native bees, they don't have a colony to protect. So if they have a stinger, they're probably not going to use it. They're not going to be very motivated to use it. So you'd have to do something like step on them or you know, when I was a little girl, I was running down the path, and I ran into a bee, and guess what? It stung me, you know, it, <laughs> they do that. Um, so you don't have to be afraid of the bees and worried about them stinging you. Swapping sweat. Ooh, this is a sweat bee, and they're called that because they'd like to they like to eat your sweat on your arm, you know, maybe. But I don't think they bite. I think they just want to taste that salt. Yep. So somebody knew it out there. We have picky eaters. What do we do with them? Well, you can't do anything with a picky eater if it's a bee. Forget it. You're not going to change its mind. Um, there are generalist bees, and they um, forage all different kinds of flowers. And then there are uh, specialist bees. Now these bees here are on a native sunflower, which by the way is the exact same species as the sunflower they grow for agriculture. It's just, you know, it's smaller because it hasn't been, you know, grown year after year after year for its size. Um, these little sunflower bees only feed on sunflowers. I only learned that six months ago. That's exciting. Ah, so I want to open up for questions before we move on. No questions. Oh, what? Yes. How many different types of bees would you expect to find in a bee friendly garden? Different species? You know, I'm going to throw out a number um, in regards to how many um, native bee species there are in the Berkeley and East Bay area. There are over 90, and, and they're still counting. So um, it depends on the area that you live in, but you will see a lot of different species. And some of them are so small that you won't see them at all. Or they dart around and you'll never figure out what the heck they are. Okay, yes. Are you including distinguishing bees and wasps? Wasps are totally different behaviors? Wasps are totally different, yes. So she's asking about distinguishing between wasps and bees, and we're talking about bees tonight. But wasps provide a lot of services also. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the only wasp that's a bad wasp is those yellow jackets that pester you at the barbecue. Um, or if there's a wasp nest above your, out your, you know, your entrance door and they're flying around where you walk in and out, that's probably not a good thing. Um, and if you try to break their nest, they're going to get really mean. As we all, most of us have heard those stories. Um, we're not going to talk much about wasps, but they really do provide a lot because they not only pollinate, but they also um, they uh, parasitize um, the aphids and some of the bad insects. So the wasps are good, the good guys in the garden. 
Other questions? Yes. Um, as far as the bees and water go, I noticed uh, fairly recently there have been some discussions on the, the Yahoo group with um, about bees drowning in bird baths. And I wonder if you had any comments about the depth of water bees need or don't need. I, my comment on that is keep it as, as little as possible. They really like to just go on little damp rocks or um, uh, I know that you have a water feature that has a very, very thin sheet of water that moves pretty slow and so the bees sit on that and it's a rough texture so the bees sit on that and feed on it. But even if, the, if they didn't, they could go to the rocks down below and get moisture. I. Yeah, that's a tough one, and I'm sure that people have been discussing that at great at great depth, <laughs> so to speak. Yes. You mentioned a suggestion for a garden club of putting pieces of cork. Yes. Like cork, cork in the bird bath. Yep. To, and then the bees sit on the cork, and I've heard that they just love that. I've heard that sometimes you get a whole group of bees there. Okay. So now we're going to start talking about food. When we're talking about food, of course, we're talking about plants. And because we're the Native Plant Society, we're talking about native plants. So the first thing you want is to have diversity throughout the year. So you want to have diversity of um, the species of plants. Um, you want to have diversity through the seasons. You want to have um, diversity at that moment, at, this, at the moment of the bloom. So let's say it's springtime. You want to have several blooming plants for the bees. Um, so diversity is really key. The next thing that you want to have is blocks of color because bees and butterflies and lots of other critters, um, they, they see that big block of color and that's what they head for. So the Xerxes Society says a minimum of three and a half by three and a half feet. Well, an awful lot of plants are three feet or wide and tall and taller. So it's not that hard to get that three and a half by three and a half feet. And this is a ceanothus uh, that's probably, I'm gonna guess four feet wide, five feet wide. It probably will grow bigger because it's probably not its you know, mature size yet. And of course the fields of poppies. And thank you, Pete, for that lovely photograph. Natives or natives? And these two are not mating because I think they're both females of different species, but, <laughs> but um, I, I think one's just saying, hey, it's my turn now. So that's um, white sage. And um, the reason that I say natives for natives is that native insects, native bees, have evolved with native plants for millennia. And they have learned, adapted to each other, and that's their preference. So. There are some non-native plants that bees really, really like, and that's cool. We're not going to talk about any of those tonight, but you can go off and research those on your own, okay? And actually, one of the websites I've been giving is a great resource for that. Okay, how is it that I pick these plants? First of all, while I was doing my self-education, I ran across the Urban Bee Study, and this is the website that I just mentioned. Um, the Urban Bee Study online is, uh, I think it's uh, helpabee.org, <laughs> cute name. Um, they've been, uh, Dr. Gordon Frankie has been studying bees in the wild since the 80s. And then he transitioned his study work uh, to, uh, to bees in urban areas. So at this point, I think they have, um, 23, about 23 study sites throughout California where they count the bees on the plants. So you're getting data. And that's a big part of where I'm coming from. Because I can guess from what happens in my yard, but I want to know what happens in other people's yards. And so this study that has been going on, and once they started with the Urban Bee Project, let's see, the, uh, they started in the late, uh, the late 1990s on that, uh, then we have some data. Um, 
based on that study and um, you know my own intuition, um, what plants do uh, bees prefer? Um, a diversity of plants. I want to make sure that some of the plants provide nectar and some of the plants provide pollen, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And that these uh, plant species attract a lot of different species of bees. Also, I chose these plants because they are drought tolerant. That's the part everybody's worried about, okay? Now, how many of you really understand what drought tolerant is? Anybody want to, you know, tell us what's drought tolerant? No summer water. No summer water. And when can you do that with a plant? Can I do it its first year when I put it in the ground? No. Okay, not, not. So it takes a little while to establish the plant and that can be three years. So I usually say with a drought tolerant plant, it's kind of a rule of thumb. The first year, the first summer, you water it once a week. Well, guess what? That's a lot less than watering your lawn. For people who have to do, are still doing lawn conversions, they'll be surprised because guess what? Immediately, they will be using less water. Immediately. Then the second year, the rule of thumb is, once every two weeks, and the third year, once every three weeks. And then some people go to no water, and others water once a month. So all these plants that I have selected are drought tolerant once they are established. All of them are easy to grow and easy to find in nurseries, and they're all really gorgeous. There are four groups of plants that we're going to talk about. One is first the composite family. We'll talk a little more about what that is. The second is the California lilac species, the um, buckwheat species, and the salvia species. So at this point, I feel like you've been here, you've learned all the basics already. Now we're gonna go into talking about the plants in more detail. I have picked three plants in each one of those groups, so we're gonna talk about 12 plants. I'm not gonna go into all the cultural stuff about them because you have that in your handouts, okay? And it's also gonna be on the screen. But um, just to, you know, I, I don't wanna bore you to tears, but we're gonna talk about how these plants attract bees and you know things that I've seen in my garden and that sort of thing. Um, but if you want to go to sleep at this point, <laughs> that's fine, because you've got all the basics already. So don't be worried if you know I said something and I forgot what it was. Okay, composite family. The composite family, this is many, many, many flowers. This is not one flower. This central yellow disc here, I don't know how many flowers are in there, but every one of those little things is a flower. And so it's called a composite flower because it's many flowers in a single disc with gray petals around the outside. The thing that insects like about this is that they get lots of food in one place. They don't have to move very far. They just go, right? They save energy, they don't have to fly from here to here to here to here. And they get this really yummy food right there on that disc. So it's super high compacted food for them. The other thing about composites is that they provide both pollen and nectar. Some plants provide one or the other, and some plants provide both. The nectar is the sugar. We all kind of, I mean, we go, oh, sugar's bad, but we all need something to, you know, give us energy, and that's what sugar does. And the, pro, uh, the uh, pollen is a protein. And then the mama bees take the nectar and the pollen, and they make bee bread, and they put it in their little nests for their babies when they hatch. That's what the native bees do. So it's really important to have both. Many flowers on a single disc. Many of these um, co in the composite family have a long blooming uh, season. So they'll start blooming maybe in the spring and you know, maybe bloom a little less in the summer and then they bloom in the fall again. 
We're going to talk about the gum plant, the coast sunflower, which both bloom in spring, and we're going to talk about goldenrod, which blooms in the summer. Now remember about the diversity throughout the year. So we're looking at spring plants and summer plants. And pretty much most of these plants, when, once they start blooming, they often continue through to the fall. This is the coast sunflower. Thank you again, Pete. That big shrub there is probably four by four, four by five feet. It blooms profusely. Um, the foliage has a really nice fragrance. Um, hang on a second here. Now, I said that I, the cultural needs, we're not gonna talk about them because they're on the slides there. You can see, you know, full sun and water, what the water needs are. If you're looking for something specific, feel free to check it out. It's on your handout, it's on the slides, but I'm not gonna discuss it in detail. Um, and the, another thing I want to mention is that a lot of people don't understand how important the botan botanical name is. So we've got a common name that's California bush sunflower. Well, it's also called the coast sunflower. It's, also, it's called probably a number. I, I, I know when I looked it up, it had a number of common names. The trouble can happen when you go to the nursery and you say, I want a coast sunflower. Who knows what you're gonna get? So you want to go to the nursery and say, I want Encelia californica. And if you don't feel comfortable pronouncing it, point to it on a piece of paper. It's OK. <laughs> All right? But I have friends who thought they bought white sage because they asked for white sage. The nursery people didn't know what they were doing in this particular situation. And they brought home what looked like white sage. But it's not. Now, it is a native sage, but it's not white sage. So, you know, you really, it really does work that way. You really do need to know your botanical names. At least look them up before you go to the nursery. Okay, the Urban Bee Study says that this Encelia is highly recommended and should be used more widely in gardens because, again, pollen, nectar, long bloom. And super easy. The hardest part is keeping it small. Oh my gosh, Judy was at my house the other day and it was, it's eight feet wide, you know? <laughs> I didn't get to prune it when I usually do. So it took over. So um, one of the things about this plant is that it can be rangy and so you want to hard prune it once a year. And that's the part I didn't get to. Sometimes, you know, life happens, you know, I'm a little busy. Okay, here's another picture of it. This is a lot taller than three feet. Oh, no, it's, it's about four feet. Really? Yeah, let's go back. Let me go back. Yeah, it, it's kind of hard to tell, but that's four or five feet tall there. Um, a person would be, yeah, that's about a five foot, that's about a five foot shrub there. Yes? When you say hard prune, how far mm -hmm. back are we going? You can actually go back, I would go back to the ground, but you can leave some stems. You can go back like a foot. To almost to the ground and we're talking you know a five-foot shrub and I do it I do it after the frost uh, because I, 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 I believe that it's frost tender a little bit so I don't want to prune off all the you know foliage that's protecting it um, but yes I love this plant I do too <laughs> I love this plant. she loves so it. I have one in my yard it's about eight years old and it gets tall. It gets tall. How tall? So, oh, six. Six seven, feet? Yeah. Six, seven feet? Yeah. So, six, seven feet, folks. <laughs> Don't trust the books. But the thing, it, the thing of it is, is that the only time it doesn't mine is in full sun. The only time it does not bloom is in December and January. December and January, it's not and, blooming. And that's okay. Yeah. Because at that time, I have borage going. Okay, yes, we're showing that. Yeah. Do you deadhead yours? Because mine has so many flowers, I don't have time to deadhead I, it. I deadhead. She had deadheads hers, so that she's keeping it in bloom all the time. Mine kind of goes, it has a big bloom, and then it'll kind of back off and 
calm down and rest for a, for a few weeks and then it'll bloom again and rest for a week or so and then bloom again. Because I can't keep up with the deadheading. It's yes. just too huge. <laughs> but it's for put, hu put hubby out there. Get, for, get to work. For entertainment, <laughs> for entertainment value, it's like... And yeah, the bees are amazing. Bees are, yeah. So many bees, especially the longhorn bees is what I see yes. mostly. They just love this plant. They just love this plant. They spend the night Oh, we're getting to that. Oh, we're getting to that. Don't give away my secret. <laughs> okay, the coast gum plant. Again, the Urban Bee Study says this is highly recommended and should be used more widely. And a great source of nectar and pollen. In my garden, actually, I just planted one. So I don't have a lot of information about how many bees and that sort of thing. Anybody have one in their garden that is established? Mine's just barely starting to bloom. I get um, these small bees that collect pollen on their back legs. So they always look so cute. You know, they're just full of these packs they of have, pollen. Is it um, a, like a solid pack or is it like their hairs are all covered, the fuzzy hairs are covered with well, bits? Yeah, they're all their they're all hairs. The like fuzzy hairs. Pie, so yeah, yeah just and little, really, really little. Yeah, they're, they're pretty small. Pretty small bees on there. That's cool. Then there's another photo of it. California goldenrod. In my garden, I have it in two places. I have it on the street in the parking strip where it's really, really, really hot because it's the uh, western side of the house and the street. So it gets really hot. Mine's already blooming, has been for about a week, maybe a week and a half. In the back yard, it hasn't started. It's just putting on the buds. And so it'll bloom, really come into its own in the summer, which is really important for some of those uh, summer bees. Now, this is um, a plant. It's a composite. Right, where you have the center with all the bunch, lots and lots of little flowers, but it's so small that it's mostly the smaller bees that you see on it, at least in my yard. And this is a, uh, this is a leaf cutter bee, I believe. Um, it does spread by roots, but not too aggressively. You can kind of pull them out. And um, it's not allergenic. People think that this is a, a, something that's gonna you know, give them the sneezes, but it actually has evolved to uh, uh, work with the bees, and so it needs bees to take the pollen from here to there. California lilac. You know what? I don't ever call it that. I just call it Ceanothus. Everybody's nodding their heads. Okay, so can, can I have permission to just use the botanical name in this case? Because I know I'm supposed to be like, you know, common name friendly, but see and note, this is just as easy as California lilac. So um, one of the things um, about plants is that some of them are very, very fragrant, and see and note, this is one of those. And that fragrance goes out, and it's basically, you know, turning on the diner light, going dinner, 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 dinner's over here, calling all those bees and pollinators. Um, so, you know, this um, mostly provides pollen. Even though it smells heavenly, you'd think that it would have nectar, but not so much. Um, has an incredibly profuse bloom, and so there's lots of food for the, for the uh, bees. Um, many flowers in one many flowers in the, one of those clusters, and uh, see, you know, this blooms really, really early, and um, so it's really great for those early spring bees. So you want to be thinking about that again, the diversity throughout the year. Um, all of them, all of these bloom in the spring. Now, the interesting thing that I found was that the Urban Bee Study recommended cultivars. They didn't say put in this straight species of Ceanothus. They said, use Dark Star, use Ray Hartman, and use Yankee Point. I thought, that's cool, because that's the ones I like, and they work best in the garden. Because that's what they were, you know, chosen for, because they do so well in the garden. So those are the three we're going to talk about. So the first one is Dark Star. Again, Pete. Oh, Pete. 
Anybody know how to pronounce his last name? Ginny? Bilou? Bilou. Whatever. <laughs> we'll just call him Pete. Pete of East Bay Wilds. Um, wonderful man. Does a lot of things in relationship to native plants. Okay, Dark Star. The Dark Star. Um, mine starts to bloom in February. So it's really late winter. <coughs> Very early spring. Um, it's usually covered in um, honeybees and um, uh, carpenter bees and um, some little <coughs> tiny itty bitty bees that I don't know what they are. Dark Star, after it's established, prefers no summer water. I've heard that you can kill them if you water them in the summer. I don't know anybody else have a different experience with that. Okay. It's a carpenter bee. Ray Hartman, very, very large. This one hasn't been, maybe it's been pruned, but not a lot. And here's a photo of one that's been, probably it's not, probably not mature, but it's probably been pruned. Um, you can leave it as a shrub, you know, so the branches are down to the ground. You can prune it up into a multi-trunk tree. Uh, <laughs> I know when the bumblebee queens come out because of Ceanothus. Because the way it works with the bumblebees is that the queens come out first, they feed, and then they go back in the nest and they raise enough daughters, and they're going out and feeding and raising, feeding these daughters until the daughters are old enough to go out and do the foraging, and then the queen stays in the nest. Well, the first bumblebees that you see in the garden are on the Ceanothus. And so you can go, that's a queen. That's a queen. You, you know, it's so amazing when you know just these little things and then you're out there in the garden watching these critters do their thing. And I think this was early spring, so that's probably a queen. Okay, Yankee Point. So the first one was Dark Star, which is a kind of a medium-ish sized shrub, and then Ray Hartman, which is huge and tree-like, and now we've got Yankee Point, which is more of ground cover. And <laughs> I forget which park we were at, but Hubby and I were at the park, and there was a Yankee Point. They had a sign on it. It said it was Yankee Point, so you know this, and it was this tall, and it went like this. <laughs> it looked like a haystack. So um, you do have to prune your Yankee Point, and pruning Ceanothus is, uh, you need to do it after the rains are done because it doesn't heal very well and you don't want it to get, you know, bad bugs. You know, you don't want it to, to hurt it in any way. So you prune it after the last rains. Basically, the summer's a good time. Um, Yankee Point, if it's got the branches going straight up, those are the ones that are gonna like build that mound. So they tell you, you know, that it's a low ground cover, but it won't stay that way if you don't prune it. Um, it's also great for um, an espalier on a fence, if the fence isn't too high. Okay, we're gonna have some more behaviors. Okay, this is a ground nesting bee coming out of its little hole. Someone asked me once, what do the ground nests look like? What they look like holes? I didn't know the answer at that time. I thought it was, I thought that was the answer, but I didn't know. Now I know. If they look like holes. Then there's stem nesting. Now this is a little bee, bees unknown, because we don't know what it is. Anyway, <laughs> this is actually in stems that have been made, um, some probably homemade, or maybe somebody bought at a store. Uh, if you want, you can make your own bee hotels out of stems and sticks and that sort of thing, or drill holes in wood, and there's all kinds of resources online on how to do that. Um, but in nature, the stems of the plants become their home. And that's where they lay their eggs. Stealing, you little bee. So plants basically give insects 
nectar as a reward for moving their pollen from place to place, right? Pollinating the plants. And this little lady is stealing the nectar. She's putting her proboscis at the base of the flower because she can't fit inside and stealing the nectar and not pollinating the plant. Okay. All the photos of bees that I've taken and all the photos that, I, that are by me, which this one is, are in my garden, except this one, which is down in uh, Anzabrego Desert. Sometimes you'll find a bee napping in a flower. Does anybody know what that is? Why is the bee napping in the flower? <laughs> okay, so hubby and I have a joke. All right, how do you know a male bee from a female bee? have to work. They have to collect a lot of food for those children. But the males, they only have to feed themselves. So they're the ones that are napping. Okay? And of time. <laughs> End of time. All the men get up and walk out. <laughs> I, thought they, I thought they were lurking. They're not. They're not. And the, and the females are out there because they've got an intense amount of work to do. And of course, the guys have one other job in life, and that's it, you know. Okay. Questions? Yes. So far. Yeah. Yellow and blue, yes. Pretty much, although we're going to see some white ones. So bees um, are attracted to yellow and blue, hummingbirds to red. But that's not the only thing, because I've seen hummingbirds feed on other colors, and I've seen bees feed on other colors. But yeah, it's kind of one of the color spectrums that they see. How are we doing on time? Cool. I'm just checking the time, because I'm like, I have no clue. <laughs> yes? I was going to, um, you were talking about you know, I'm really not sure that I know the answer to that question, okay. whether they hibernate in the winter. Does anybody? Uh, Steve does. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Take the microphone. Uh, <laughs> most uh, native bees uh, hibernate, or they, uh, but Honeybees can come out early. The reason is honeybees store food, right? They got hot. Most native bees live from day to day. It's one of the reasons you have to give them food all the time. But because honeybees have a store of food, they can come out early in the year, like on your Ceanothus. It's one of the reasons you saw the uh, honeybees there so yep. early. And they'll start collecting uh, nectar and pollen uh, early because they've got a food source that they've already stocked away. Good. Thank you, Stephen. All right. We're more than halfway through. Anybody napping? No, none of the guys napping. <laughs> There's a gentleman back there napping. No, do you have a question? Yeah. Yeah. I will tell you that and then we'll move on quickly. Um, Africanized bees did start in the um, South America's um, countries and uh, were moving north and are still moving north. What the scientists did was, um, and you all know those are called killer bees, right? So what the scientists have been doing, they've probably been doing a number of things, but the one that I'm, I'm aware of is that they interbreed those um, more aggressive bees with more docile honeybees to try to calm them down. And that seems to be working. So I think by the time they get here, they're probably not gonna be killers anymore, just um, bugs, you know? And just, you know, <laughs> mug you for your purse. <laughs> okay, buckwheat species. Um, they provide both pollen and nectar, so a great food source. Um, those little clusters there are many, many, many little flowers in a cluster. So again, sort of like the composite, the bees can be kind of lazy and they can get a lot of food in one place. 
Um, the flowers are really small, so any size bee can use them. They start blooming in the summer and pretty much continue until, you know, fall or when it gets cold, even when it freezes. Um, long bloom. Okay, summer blooming, California buckwheat, red buckwheat, and nude buckwheat. I would imagine that the spraying is hurting them. No sides is my <laughs> is my 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 take on the world. Don't use poisons, you know, and it's it's a challenge. Okay, California buckwheat. Um, this picture of the California buckwheat behind the furniture on the left is actually a pretty young plant. Um, they can get six feet wide is what they say. They can get bigger than that they can get eight feet wide. So, you know, make sure you have room for it. Um, in the hot, yeah. 10 feet, 10 feet, you, you measured it, yeah. It's like, enough of this. <laughs> I know, the space was planned for six feet and it got to be 10 feet. Um, in my garden, on the, when, once it starts blooming, it's hot summer days out there and there are bazillions of all kinds of interesting pollinators on the California buckwheat. And just all kinds, large bees, small bees, and all kinds of little things. Wasps are feeding on the nectar and eating the bugs and doing all kinds of stuff out there, so it's really fun. Um, this plant is a very, very reliable bloomer, so if you're just kind of getting started out, and you want something that's gonna look pretty the first year, this'll do it, because it's gonna bloom in its first year. And it'll make you happy. Here's a close up with a valley carpenter bee. Pretty girl there. You can see those tiny, tiny little flowers in those clusters. Question. Yes. Pruning, 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 yeah, the whole thing. You just nicely prune the shape, yeah, yeah. And pretty much, you know, in the fall, when you just cut it back. Yeah, pretty hard, pretty hard pruning. Um, this is Ellen Nelson's um, nude buckwheat. And the reason I put that in here is not because, you know, I think you should all go out and buy Ellen Nelson's yellow. Um, because the regular nude buckwheat is white, and that's much more common in the nurseries. The reason is just because I couldn't find a darn photo of it, and I couldn't believe it because it's used so much. And I thought, i got to go out in my yard this summer and take pictures of the nude buckwheat because it's a gorgeous plant, and put that up so that people can you know, have access to that. But yellow is also very beautiful. Um, the yellow is not as available, but you can find it. And um, it tends to bloom a little earlier. So like the yellow one in my yard and in my friend's yard starts blooming mid-spring. So it's already in bloom. Whereas the white variety starts blooming in summer. And so the white nude, nude, the white nude buckwheat in my naked buckwheat in my yard is just getting its stalks are just about this high and they'll get you know maybe about that high before they start blooming. Question? Yes. Say Annie's annuals. Yes, I wasn't going to say that. I didn't want to advertise. So she said, she said Annie's annuals, but I'm not advertising. Um, <laughs> thank you. I was hoping somebody might say that. Um, so the white species is very available. The th key thing that you want to know about this plant also is that it's our local buckwheat. So our local bees like it. Okay, so people get into how native is it? Is it native in this little area where I live? Is it native to this bigger area where I live? Or is it native to California, the California Floristic Province? Or is it native just to the state of California, which is two different things, right? So, you know, how native is it? Well, this one happens to be a local native. So your local native bees are gonna love it. Just about the same size. About the same size, yeah, yeah. And it's really pretty. I've had people say, oh, it's so charming. 
feel like a little fairy garden. <laughs> okay, red buckwheat. In my garden, I have this in part shade, so I don't get a lot of bees on it. Now remember those bees like full sun. So I would have been better off putting it in a little bit sunny where it got part sun, because this plant doesn't, probably wouldn't like the heat in the, in the summer in my yard. Um, so a part sun situation might be better where it still has some coolness in the afternoon, but I don't see bees on it. Anybody have this in their yard and see bees? Karen. Yeah, mine's, um, it's just in the sun, just in front of some shade. And okay. It's growing great and it's spreading out. And, and the bees? Lots of bees. A lot of bees, a lot of bees. Really pretty color, isn't it? Now, it can be a much lighter pink than that. That's probably the most intense pink I've ever seen on one of these. Um, the other thing that happens sometimes is when people plant a red buckwheat, they, um, they go, oh, I'm so disappointed in it after the first year. You really need it to fill in and to really, and to kind of spread itself out and then, you know, and have a significant amount of it because that's when it's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous. So give it some time. Now, here's a photo of it with um, where it's just starting to turn um, to some seed heads. Those orangish colors there. Um, buckwheat, um, I had didn't mention earlier, also looks really beautiful in the fall and winter with those seed heads. They turn a really beautiful um, cinnamon, uh, cinnamon brown. And um, now I know a lot of people say, don't deadhead your buckwheats. But, but I do, because otherwise I have a huge colony of blood buckwheat. <laughs> and Steve's going, yes, yes. So, you know, leave some of the seeds for the birds. That's cool, okay? But if you don't want to have them take over, or you don't want to have to weed them in the spring because you have a carpet of buckwheats, and this is all the buckwheats as far as I know, then deadhead them and get those seeds out of there. Give them to somebody that has a bird feeder, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> okay, we're on to our last group, the sage species. Nectar. No pollen. Mostly nectar. But it's really, really tasty, and I have to tell you that I actually uh, did an experiment because I wanted to know what do, what do these nectars taste like. So I went around my garden tasting nectar, and the sages are unbelievable. It would you just have this same this amazing mint flavor mixed in with the sweetness, and it's really sweet. And all you need is just a little bit on top of your dessert, and you would be in heaven, believe me. So I'm guessing that my taste buds are kind of in alignment with the with the bees' taste buds on this. In this case, the other flowers, eh, no big deal. But sage, mm. again, very fragrant. So it's calling all the bees to dinner. Um, black sage in the spring, Brandon G's sage, and then spring, uh, both spring and fall is Star's Choice. Um, also another surprise from the Urban Bee Study is another cultivar, but I'll explain why they selected this one. Okay, black sage. Highly recommended, should be used more, Urban Bee Study. I don't have this. Does anybody have this in their in their garden? Yes. Does tell us about the bees. Um, I mean, I haven't really observed it really correctly. There are definitely. I have a lot of buckwheat, and I have this right next to it. Right next There's to the buckwheat. There's tons of bee action, but I haven't specifically. Right. Heard. Lots and lots of bees, though. Yeah. 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 And does it is it just in the spring, or does it go through to summer? Is it blooming for a longer period of time? Spring. Mainly spring, yeah. It's a really big shrub um, also. And that's why I don't have it in my yard, because I ran out of space, as many of us gardeners understand. <laughs> this is Dar's Choice, and the reason that the Urban Bee Study put this in is because they observed bees on it, but it is a hybrid of black sage 
and um, another sage, another native sage. And so they recommend if you don't have space for a huge black sage, use this. And so I do have this in my garden. I didn't know that at the time, but I was like, oh, yay. <laughs> because black sage is like the ultimate in the native sages uh, for bees. But I have some Dar's Choice here and there. And, um, and believe me, the bees are waiting for those flowers to open. They're like in the leaves going, OK, when is it opening today? No. Oh, darn. I didn't eat something else. Question. Yes. The leaves are so dark. That's that's why I think they call it black sage. Yeah, the leaves are, are not um, a medium-sized green. Um, would you say that's yeah. really such a dark green that it's, it looks black? Blackish, dark. It's really, really a dark green. Very deep. Anybody else have a thought on why it's called black sage? I think that's the reason. Okay. Brandegees, 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 whatever, probably whatever you want to call it. Um, this is our last plant. Oh my gosh, we're almost done. Okay, we have the last plant, and then we have the last behaviors. So the last plant. Okay, those of you that are napping, wake up. Okay, again, the Urban Bee Study says highly recommended should be used more in gardens. Important nectar source for those spring bees. Anybody have this in their garden? No, it's not seen that much. Yeah, I think people have black sage more often than this one. Um, that, I actually did have one for a while. That's a photo of it. So it's got a nice pretty green, a really pretty color of green. And since it's a, a sage, I would imagine that. Okay. Behaviors. All right. Head budding. Males. Well, probably even the females, but they they like to go and say, "Hey, get off that flower." <laughs> and sometimes you can watch them, and they'll go, Boop. "Doesn't get off the flower." Boop. Doesn't get off the flower. Boop. Finally, after a while, the guy that's on the flower gets off. <laughs> Sometimes, I think it's, can, I, I suspect that females do it too, but I, I probably more likely it's the males and it's some of their territorial behaviors that they have um, because uh, uh, male bees can be territorial and plus they have the time and energy to be bunking other bees where the females are just like, I'll go to another flower and I'll get the food there. <laughs> Cruising, another guy thing. Hey, where's the girls? Um, this is one of the male valley carpenter bees. Again, that's a big bee. And they come up to you, and they look at you. And you think, oh my god, <laughs> I'm going to die. But they don't have stingers. And they have never, ever come so close to me that I honestly believe that they were going to do anything to me. And basically what they're doing is they're doing that territorial thing, right? They are trying to keep the other males out of their territory. They pick an area, and you can watch them fly around in that area. And I'll have one flying here, and one flying right next to them over here, and one flying over there. And then those two, every now and then, fly in the other guy's territory. And then, oh my gosh. So <laughs> it's like a circus out there. <laughs> now, for the ultimate. Longhorn bees, after a day of headbutting and cruising and telling all those guys, get out of here, they sleep together. <laughs> I don't know, it sort of reminds me of the armchair quarterbacks who like they jostle each other with their words and they, you know, are act all tough while they're watching their football game and, and, and you think, they don't like each other at all. But then they go, hey, let's do it again next week. <laughs> That's these guys. All right, so we are winding this up. What we talked about today. We talked about how to create habitat. No sides, full sun, nesting areas. What I didn't mention is those nesting areas in the ground, I neglected to say, you do not want mulch. 
You want to have some areas of the ground where there's no mulch or rock. You can have rock. I have areas that have rock as, as a mulch. It's because the little bees don't like to try and get in to their nests in the mulch, through the mulch. Yes? How big are their holes? Can you really see them? Depends on the bee, and I've never seen one. I mean, I might have and didn't know. I've never seen a bee coming out of a hole. Yeah. I think it just depends on the size of the bee. About a quarter of an so they need nesting places, so you can leave some bare ground for them in a place that gets morning sun. At probably afternoon shade would be nice because you don't want to get too hot in the summer. Um, you provide water and you provide food for them. We also talked about the um, four groups that, of plants that bees adore. Composite family, the California lilac species, otherwise known as Ceanothus, um, buckwheat, and salvia. We, I introduced you to 12 plants. You have all the cultural information there. If you want more cultural information on plants, I just type in my you know, Google search. I just type nursery and the botanical name of the plant, and you'll come up with a list of nurseries that provide you the cultural needs of the plant. They may or may not carry the plant, but a lot of nurseries support the native plant community in that way. And there's some really good websites. I introduced you to a few bees, some of which, you know, do strange things, but they're fun. Behaviors. You have more resources in your handouts, and there's a video being uh, taped that's going to be on the website, the um, CNPS GWN website. And last questions. This is your last chance. Okay, nappers, you can be awake now. Yes? If they sting you, do they die? Probably, yeah, if they sting you, they die. If they're probably, I'm guessing they're like honeybees where the stinger just, you know, pops off of them and they, but I don't know that for a fact. Do you get stung much? I never get stung. I've never been stung. Only when I was a little girl running down the, running down the path and happened to run into one. No, I stand there. I, and sometimes I want to pet them. So, <laughs> but I haven't. I haven't. Um, this, this lady had a question next, and I'll get over there. Yes? Um, this may not be exactly on topic, but uh -huh. I've noticed on my path, when I was walking through the woods, that there was a lot of bees on my path, which is very sunny. I'll see dead bees quite often. Dead bees on your path? Like honeybees or native bees or just something? I, I don't know how to identify bees, but they're, okay. they're So probably honeybees. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Do they live very long? Or, I mean, they six, six weeks. Six weeks, thank you. Six weeks. Six weeks. OK. Um, you didn't mention manzanilla, but it's on here. You're right. I, I added two, I added two um, groups of plants because I knew we wouldn't have time. OK? And a manzanita, I would highly recommend because it starts blooming in the winter and blooms through the spring. And so there are bees that are very, very early bees, and they love manzanita. And then I put phacelia on there, too, because it's just such a wonderful plant for providing pollen and nectar. Yes? So I just have to interject. Yes. I didn't, I didn't uh, ping the speaker or the introducer, but Sally Casey is here. Yes, Sally today. Casey is here with her plants. Her plants, they're... Two dollars a piece. Two dollars. And they're bee-friendly plants. Bee-friendly plants. Woohoo! And the money goes to CNPS. Scholarship, scholarship the scholarship fund, fund for CNPS. Very cool. Very and cool. Thank is, you. She Sally. has funded a scholarship this year. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Come and help her out. You know, Sally, I have some of your plants in my garden. I bought plants from you. Yes. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to tell you that um, Suncast Nurseries has come out with, I think it's a selection of the black sage. The black sage is selection, uh-huh. And it's called, I think it's called Sweet Honey. Sweet Honey. And it is smaller. Smaller, okay. And now, I'm just putting it in so I right. can't tell you if it works as well. Right. But Right, right. It's Whether it works that well or not. The and the cool thing is that there's, you know, I just gave you some overall groups, and there's lots and lots of cultivars and species in those groups. Yes, Steve. Uh, just one thing. I've had uh, uh, California buckwheat for a long time, and like somebody says, it can get ten feet across. It can get really big. 
One of the ways that it gets big, though, is that it sends out uh, stems that are pretty horizontal, and they'll reroute. And so if you want to keep it smaller, you can pull those secondary roots out, and it won't have so much nutrients, so it'll stay a little smaller. And I, I've done that with uh, sages, too. And with sages, too, OK. Yeah. Cool. And I know that one of the 10-foot um, buckwheats does not have any rooted branches on it. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this is huge. I know I saw another hand. Yes? Yes. Um, the honeybees have um, been in trouble for quite a while with colony collapse disorder, or CCD for short. Um, I did give you a resource at the end, um, a website where you can go and catch up on what's happening and what they've learned. I believe that um, right now they're thinking that the primary, um, the primary um, culprit is um, one of the um, neonicotinoids. Well, neonicotinoids, which is a pesticide, but also one of the um, mites. And basically, it's a it's a disorder that they believe is a number of pressures, of uh, stress pressures on the bees, and um, you know. The, the commercial um, honeybees are shipped all over the country. Um, they feed in, in uh, uh, places where there's uh, pesticides, and if they're in a, in a garden, you know, in an orchard where there aren't pesticides, guess what, there's pesticides next door. Um, and then there's, um, and those things put a lot of pressure on them. And the neonicotinoids, am I saying that right? <laughs> neonicotinoids. Oh, the other thing is that, you know, they're, they're like, mm -hmm. like Debbie says, they're, they're being shipped but they, they've got this job and they're only pollinating almonds or they're only, only pollinating. So they don't get enough if, diversity. If, if you only got one kind of food, you might not be real healthy. Right, right. Another stress pressure on them. Yeah. And then, you know, the mites and the pesticides have just, you know. But they don't, I, at last I heard they don't know the exact answer yet. They're still researching and it's been many years. And the key thing about native uh, bees is, you know, the scientists, and I think you all read the, the uh, intro, you know, the, the blurb on this talk, and if you didn't, then I'll just talk about it. Um, the scientists um, started really studying native bees when colony collapse disorder started, because they wanted to know, and they still want to know, can these native bees pollinate agricultural crops? And the answer is yes, and in fact, some of them pollinate better, and honeybees are more efficient pollinators when they're pollinating next to native bees. And it has something to do with the way that they move between the male and female flowers when there's native bees present. So having native bees, so there's a lot of work now towards putting in um, hedgerows, um, hedgerows for native bees in agricultural areas so that they can start relying more and more on native bees while we're dealing with this issue with the honeybees. So we had time. If we didn't have time to talk about that, I wouldn't have gone into such detail, but we had time. All right, more questions. How are we doing? Thank you so much.